Well, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Benson Gray. I work at Stroudwater with, uh, with both Doug and Jeff. Stroudwater, as you probably know, is a leading national healthcare consulting firm with offices in Portland, Maine, Atlanta, and Nashville. And today's presenters are going to be Jeffrey Summer from our Portland, Maine office, who's the firm's managing director, and joined with Doug Johnson from our Nashville office, who's the co-practice leader in the firm's affiliations and partnerships practice. So Jeff, would you like to get us started? Thank you very much, Benson, and thank you all for joining uh, Doug and I on today's webinar. We're going to be talking today about uh, tools to assess and mitigate strategic risk, specifically for county and district and uh, authority-owned hospitals. Um, there's some unique characteristics to these organizations and their governance structure that I think are worthy of uh, specific consideration. Um, so we're going to present a framework for assessing an organization's risk profile, uh, describe sources of strategic and operating risk, um, provide some background on both the industry uh, trends and also, again, some specific risk factors for county and district-owned hospitals, and then really focus on eight tools that we've identified via our national practice that we believe are specifically um, um, well-tailored and considered for uh, county and district-owned hospitals to mitigate strategic and operating risk. Um, let's start, if we will, around the role of the board and what we believe are some blind spots that we've seen over the last decade or so. Um, as many of you know, the fiduciary responsibilities of a board mo member are duty of care, duty of loyalty, and duty of obedience, very specific legal description of, of each. Um, but in addition to that, more broadly, the board has certain roles um, that it, it uh, plays within not-for-profit or publicly owned facility governance, um, approving budgets and the financial review and um, uh, overview of management is, is important. Um, and most boards um, do that quite well. Um, selecting, monitoring, evaluating, compensating, and if necessarily replacing senior management. Again, I think that's one that most boards um, are, are performing reasonably well. Ensuring compliance with applicable laws, regulations, policies, and ethical standards of the organization. This is increasingly challenging as the operating environment and regulatory environment of, of healthcare uh, becomes more complex. Um, so this is one that I think is uh, worthy of, of certainly ongoing uh, diligence and review. Establishing appropriate committees um, and determining governance practices, there's some variability here. It's sometimes hard to um, revisit the way the board has functioned uh, for decades, potentially, and update those, but certainly a worthwhile exercise and one we would encourage um, periodically most organizations to, to embark on just to make sure that they're up to date and, and using best practices. There are two, however, that we find um, a higher percentage of boards struggle with. One is defining, reevaluating, and monitoring the long-term strategy by which the organization fulfills its mission. And one of the points I would make here is um, we've seen organizations drift sometimes for several years in a downward trajectory without really any, any um, change of trajectory or assessment. And so um, this can be one where the changes are subtle enough where a board or senior management team may not um, um, have diagnosed them correctly. And so that's one thing we want to talk about today. How do you avoid that kind of strategic and operational drift that might compromise the mission of the organization? Um, related to that is understanding the organization's risk profile, reviewing and overseeing uh, the organization's management of risks. And this is more than thinking about flips and falls and um, those types of things. This is really strategic and operating risk at the highest level. Has the organization's strategic position deteriorated over a number of years? Are there certain operating trends that if left unaddressed might compromise the organization's mission? So this, those last two will be the focus of our conversation today. We've developed um, through our work um, a risk assessment framework and really look at four sources of risk um, operating um, value, which we um, look at as, as uh, being really important to the current payer environment where we're doing um, 
accountable care, value-based purchasing, a lot of focus on outcomes and quality and the, the interplay of cost and outcome, um, market, and ultimately financial. All of those come back and, and I think are seen as hitting the financial um, uh, sources of risk. These are quite, um, uh, obviously each of these is quite important uh, and quite dynamic. The important thing is that um, each of these are sources of risk in their own right, but that that risk can spill over to other categories if not appropriately addressed or managed um, given time. Um, and it's our belief that it is appropriate to monitor these annually at the board level, senior management level, so that long-term trends can be identified. Um, Part of our thinking on this topic was informed by a, an event which happened uh, a, a few years ago now. Um, and it was the, the um, thinking of a, a U.S. flag uh, cargo vessel, the Errol Faro, which was in transit from Jacksonville, Florida to Puerto Rico. And um, using the metaphor of, of this tragedy and looking at the uh, rate of hospital closures in this country, the question we posed and discussed here at Stratwater was, how does a vessel with modern communications and access to satellite uh, weather forecasting find itself in harm's way with, in a class three uh, hurricane whereby the, ve the vessel is abandoned, the crew abandoned ship, and uh, ultimately uh, the crew, entire crew and vessel are lost in the storm. Um, that trajectory or set of decisions um, I think with the Coast Guard and National Transportation Safety Board have found to be uh, preventable. Um, I think the same analysis applies to hospitals, that if we're looking at a hospital that is closed or is facing a significant curtailment of its mission, what steps could have been taken to avoid that? And that's uh, really informed our development of this, this risk profile. Um, the key point here is the El Faro did not need to find itself in uh, the track of a, of a uh, Category 3 hurricane. Um, and there were a number of things, whether it be, be delaying the voyage or perhaps changing course early on, that could have steered it safely out of harm's well with sufficient time to act. And I think the key thing for hospital leaders, again, whether they're board or senior management, is being proactive and taking timely action to avoid risks as they mount. And the best way to do that, I think, is to have an accurate assessment of how, how the risk profile is changing over time. Uh, and that's really the introduction to this concept. Um, with that, we want to um, ask you a polling question. Benson, would you like to pose the question? Sure. And we'll launch a question here. And the question, of course, is how well is your organization's risk profile understood by the hospital leadership, including the hospital board? And so we're asking if you think that your organization has completely understood this or moderate understanding of this or possibly little or no understanding of this profile or these risks as they exist. And so it looks like we've got a uh, fair number of people in, so we'll get another few seconds. And, uh, Good group. Anything you want to add? Well, the only thing I would add, uh, Benson, while we're waiting for the results to come in, is one of the the more frequent regrets we have heard when we've worked with organizations to um, assess their strategic options and help them quantify uh, a future trajectory is, I wish we'd had this conversation two years ago or 30 months ago. And um, that is the really the, the genesis behind this question is to try to understand does organizational leadership have a good um, uh, handle grasp of the risk profile so that that conversation can occur in a timely fashion and informed decisions be made. Um, and you can see here the results. 9% um, believe their hospital leadership, including the board, has a complete uh, understanding of the risk profile. The majority, 74%, uh, believe it's a moderate understanding. And 17% um, believe there's there's a really inadequate understanding of the risk profile. Um, so very helpful there. Thank you, uh, Benson. Um, with that, Doug Johnson will lead us through some of the, the industry trends and a couple other uh, items here on our agenda today. Thank you, Doug. Great. Thank you, Jeff. And I appreciate the opportunity to visit with all of you this afternoon or 
perhaps it's still morning <clears throat> or some of you are. Um, let's chat for a minute about some of these industry trends. Um, many of them are, <clears throat> are disruptive uh, and, and they're also very well documented. So we won't spend a whole lot of time sort of flipping through these, but from a macro view of sort of new industry trends, we, we're, you know, we're, in an, we're in an age where there are lots of new payment models uh, being implemented, being designed and implemented. Uh, certainly lots of new care models that are focused on, on quality and on value. As you look across the landscape, um, one of the things that, that becomes a real challenge are these new, well, not so new anymore, but the, the high deductible health plans that many, that many employees and many people find themselves a part of. Um, and really what happens as a result of that is people, uh, patients, are, are shopping for care. Uh, they're deferring their care because there's a, there's a much higher um, out-of-pocket uh, uh, implementation, impl implications for the decisions that they make. Um, we, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's pretty well known and pretty well understood now that we are, <clears throat> we are in a pay for performance environment. So these new payment models, these new care models are focused on quality, or at least now for things like readmissions and, and hospital acquired infections. Uh, so um, we really are in an, an era of, of consumerism uh, for pay for performance. Uh, the, other, the other interesting thing that's it's really been um, interesting to watch is the market consolidation and the new entrance into the market. Uh, you know, we're all familiar with the, the Aetna CVS link up, uh, Walmart and Humana, some of the things that Amazon, Berkshire, uh, Hathaway and JP Morgan are doing. I was at a roundtable discussion not long ago here in Nashville where uh, Larry Merlot, who's the CEO of, of CVS, he basically said, well, he did say, he said, we want to create a new front door to American healthcare. So, I mean, end of the day, if you've got a CVS, you've got a Walgreens, you've got a Walmart, uh, those types of, of, of retailers in your community, uh, they're, they're in healthcare. They're, they're looking to provide healthcare services that traditionally have been provided uh, by the, the, the hospital and the healthcare organization in, the, in your community. Benson, it didn't advance. Next slide, there we go, thank you. <clears throat> if you look at, so another, another headwind that many of us are dealing with uh, is the fact that Medicare reimbursement continues to decline. Uh, and this is a problem because obviously the Medicare rolls will continue to increase as, as the baby boomers age in. Uh, and it's also a problem because many of the commercial reimbursement methodologies are tied to Medicare rates or, or, or they, they follow closely behind with some of the, the Medicare new payment models. Um, and you know, like, like has been well, been well documented uh, throughout the last several years, you need to be able to s survive in a Medicare world. So where, where do the, the credit rating agencies line up behind uh, this particular, the, the, this industry and the sector? Uh, obviously the credit, your credit rating is the lifeblood to your capital access. Um, organizations like Moody's and Standard and & Poor's and, and Fitch uh, watch this industry and provide credit ratings um, if you look at some of their recent uh, comments about their outlook for this year and also into next, they still they see continued operating cash flow uh, struggles that they will either remain flat or or perhaps even continue to decline. Uh, and I think it's interesting that you see that many hospital uh, organizations, many healthcare organizations, are doing a good job of fixing their cost structures. Um, but end of the day, you can't cut your way to, pos to prosperity. And, and very often, uh, the revenue declines that we're experiencing are continue to outpace our ability to trim costs and become more efficient. 
and, uh, and I'll mention, you know, another thing that um, another headwind that many of us deal with is the, you know, it's difficult to find volume growth to build on that, that revenue line. Uh, it's, it's difficult to find that volume growth when more and more services are migrating out of the acute care setting and into a more efficient ambulatory care setting. So we'll chat more about that in a second. So really, if you, you know, the fallout from this change, the changing industry dynamics and some of the, 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 the industry trends that we just talked about um, are, are documented here on this map of, of hospital closures. You know, if, if, you're not, if you're not adapting and changing and repurposing uh, your organization and, and how you provide healthcare services, uh, you know, eventually you're gonna, you end up falling by the wayside. And I think, you know, if you look at this map, you'll see that a lot of the closures are in the non-Medicaid expansion states, but that's certainly not the rule. Um, and I think it's, it's a mis, it's, it, there's a misconception that most of these uh, hospital closures are, you know, the small rural backwood, you know, uh, rural community hospitals. And they're not. If you look at the distribution, it's pretty equally distributed between rural and urban hospitals. So let's, like Jeff mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the focus of our of our talk today is is on these, uh, you know, the county district authority owned hospitals. Um, you know, there's a handful of uh, challenges that are specific to um, this group of hospitals, and as, we, as I address these handful of points here that pertain to county or district owned or, or authority owned hospitals. Uh, just a, a um, comment about, you know, th these are really broad points that we're going to make. Um, you really need to consult your enabling legislation because there are unique provisions in your enabling legislation that created your hospitals and it governs what you can do. Um, so, but on a very broad basis, you know, the, the, these types of hospital organizations, these types of, of governance structures, um, you know, typically have multiple layers of responsibility, uh, and sometimes there are blurred lines uh, as it pertains to accountability and who's responsible for what. I think a simple example of that is sort of a landlord-tenant relationship where oftentimes the county, the city, the authority um, could sort of be described as the landlord. They own the assets, uh, then, but the hospital board, um, you know, as, as the tenant is, is operating that facility. And oftentimes, the hospital will say to back to the, the tenant will say back to the landlord, you know, don't meddle. Uh, we're, we, we're, we're doing just fine. Uh, leave us alone. You don't need to be uh, 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 sticking your nose under the tent where, where it doesn't belong. Um, and of course, that only creates issues. And sometimes when those types of issues start to spill over into public debate, it becomes more difficult to, to persuade talented and capable uh, community members to be part of your boards and, and, and to uh, participate in the, in the setting of the mission and vision for your hospital. Um, we sometimes see uh, elected officials who put their uh, political agendas ahead of the, the mission and vision of the healthcare organization and, and sometimes don't do what's best in the best interest of, of the hospital. Um, you know, one of the other uh, limiting factors in some cases for for these authority owned hospitals or government owned hospitals um, is they're not allowed to expand outside of their of their district boundary or the county or the parish whatever that might be and it limits their ability to compete effectively uh, in the service area so that becomes uh, a challenge for them um, and also to the extent that you have a distressed asset uh, in, in in some cases in some jurisdictions um, the the hospital is not does not have the option to to file for bankruptcy, which what eliminates a uh, a useful strategy to restructure and reset operating strategies, especially you know for those that are saddled with debt or, or onerous debt covenants. Uh, but again, I I'll, I will I will encourage you strongly to make sure you consult your enabling legislation as you deal with these types of of issues, so that because they give some good definition around what you're what you're able to do and what some of the limitations might be. So just in a handful of other um, challenges that, that get presented to, 
to the county and district owned hospitals, very often you're subject to open meeting and sunshine laws, which make it very difficult to set a strategic path because you know, your competitors who perhaps are privately held or, or a separate 501c3 uh, can follow along all the things that you're doing and try to essentially stay one step ahead of you. Um, another unique thing for some uh, publicly owned hospitals, especially in, uh, you know, I guess perhaps states like Texas, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, uh, some of these oil and gas states um, whose in, in, in some of those hospital districts are flush with cash and they provide a nice mill levy to the hospital. Well, sometimes or oftentimes that will mask some the, the financial and operating struggles of the hospital. Uh, so those are the types of things that, that you need to sort of look behind the um, peel back the layers and appreciate, you know, the real financial operational uh, uh, situation in the hospital. And, you know, one of the things that we have experienced a lot is once there's the, the operating performance at the hospital starts to erode, um, now you're creating exposure for your, for your taxpayers. And at that point, that's when people start to get involved. And, and that's when, you know, essentially the genie comes out of the bottle and you, you really start to, to have uh, issues within the, within the public forum. And he, this is just an example of a, of a handful of situations where, um, you know, communities that have all of, you know, once, once the hospital started trending in the wrong direction uh, and, and, you know, conflict began between the hospital and the, and the courthouse or the, or the city hall, um, you know, it, it's important not to let yourself get into the, a, a spot where uh, all of a sudden the press is involved and it, and it sells and it sells good and it sells a lot of newspapers um, because, like I said, it's difficult at that point to put the genie back into the bottle and get things turned around and, and get things fixed. Thank so you, I Doug. We, I think uh, Benson will walk us through a second polling question here. Yes. Now I've got another question you can pine on is do the hospital board and county district board share consistent understanding of the hospital's strategic and operating risk profile here you can say yes they're they're highly aligned and on the same page or somewhat aligned there may be a some significant uh, misalignment in some areas or no neither one has a an accurate appreciation of where things are going and so Feel free to uh, put in your answers. Uh, a few to and this really um, foreshadows, I think, one of the key risk factors for th these particular uh, organizations. In many instances, um, where you've got a county district or authority, and then perhaps a a, a 501c3 hospital board that's that's leasing the facility or operating the facility, um, there is an opportunity for there to be. Um, dissonance, distrust, miscommunication that can exist, especially if circumstances are um, challenging. And you can see from the results here, uh, slightly less than 30% believe that both the hospital and county district board are highly aligned and both knowledgeable about the risk factors. Um, the uh, middle ground, uh, slightly south of 60%, of um, there is uh, misalignment that exists um, between the county district board and perhaps the hospital board. And then another 13% say that basically uh, neither board has an accurate uh, appreciation um, for the organizational risk profile. So what's, what's concerning as a, uh, an advisor to these organizations is somewhere approaching 70% um, of these organizations either have one or both boards that don't have an accurate uh, appreciation of, of risk. So, uh, important uh, uh, to consider. What we want to do is spend a little bit of time getting into more detail around um, this framework, the strategic risk framework. And you can see here there's, there's a number of metrics associated with each quadrant of risk that we believe are, are important. Um, and and um, we would suggest that these would be worthwhile for an organization to monitor and look at um, over time. Um, um, so let me, let me just quickly go back to this. Um, what, what is important is that on a combined basis, these provide a balanced way to assess risk 
and it's it's more than just looking at financial indicators, which are critical, um, but are often um, lagging indicators of other risk factors manifesting themselves. So it's not just a question of financial performance. We want to look at some of the operating metrics, which are leading indicators of, of downstream financial performance. We want to understand how the organization is positioned, both in terms of some of these new payment models and some of the risk exposure that every hospital is increasingly having uh, because payers are paying based upon quality. Uh, and then obviously there's a whole bunch of, of initiatives that organizations can undertake to move into whether it's risk bearing payment, capitation, bundle payments, accountable care organizations um, um, and the like, those are increasingly important. And obviously the market indicators, some of these are lagging indicators, changes in market share, that data is often a year, 18 months old by the time you see it, but certainly wanting to appreciate consumer preference and reputational um, items uh, when those are, are available to you to understand longer term trends, all very important. Um, so Benson is gonna ask another polling question here. So now we're on to which area of risk is for your organization is the least understood? Understanding there are a variety of options here. You could have financial revenue, cash flow. You could have operating, again, full-time employees, case mix, prior payer mix, volume. You could have market share issues. And of course, you could have value, cost, quality, and managing risk. So feel free to uh, jump in. And thank you, Benson. Again, you can see here listed next to the categories are some of the indicators that are how we think of, of those risks and how we would uh, monitor those um, going forward. Okay, so got most people in now, we can show that. Um... Very interesting, uh, a pretty even split between the four categories. Um, um, and, uh, you know, I think that shows, I think, the complexity and multivariate risk environment that we're all operating in. I'm pleasantly surprised to see value get as high a score as it did. That's often something that is, for a lot of folks, one degree removed from the the immediate financial operating and perhaps market-driven imperatives. It's, it's certainly an important strategic consideration and risk vector, um, but one that often um, is viewed as being perhaps more remote than the other three. So that's uh, quite interesting. Um, so thinking about risk, um, this, this graphic um, is really a nice encapsulation um, of how Stroudwater thinks about risk uh, and, and organizational uh, performance. This is one that looks at um, earnings before interest depreciation, depreciation amortization. It's a key um, financial um, risk um, um, metric and barometer of performance. And you can see here the vertical bars are EBITDA. We fitted a dotted line, which is the trend line. So there's a dip in 2014, but overall the trend is, is up, upward sloping. So that's a positive indicator um, when we look at this six year trend. We've overlaid three thresholds of performance onto this performance to provide some strategic context to it. Um, the red line you see there is, we call that survive. That is, is there enough operating cash flow to pay debt service? Uh, in this case, with the exception of 2014, this organization checks the box and in a robust way. The next threshold above that is what we call the sustained threshold. It's are you generating enough cash to pay debt service plus fund 120% of depreciation. This is a test of whether the organization is generating enough cash to renew its asset base and stay current with technology, equipment, uh, and, and, and the various imperatives of being a current, up-to-date healthcare enterprise. Uh, and in this case, you can see the organization has struggled to meet that threshold, although most recent fiscal year has attained that threshold. The last threshold we call Thrive. In addition to the two other thresholds, it adds 4% of operating expense. And this would be a required level of performance for an organization that's facing you know, we've got an antiquated facility, we need to do a replacement hospital or perhaps a new bed tower, or there's some really compelling strategic or competitive initiative, we need to invest in a set of ambulatory sites to, to safeguard our market and serve our community better. 
So there's some overarching major strategic initiative that must be funded, uh, and that's the level of performance that, that would be required to achieve that. So provide some, some historical context that's important. Another key uh, indicator is how the organization does on quality metrics. This is um, HCAPS, which is uh, developed and, and publicized by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Studies. In this case, you can see um, uh, our client was the third from the left, actually performed quite well um, on these metrics relative to its competitors, relative to state and national average um, in that instance. So it's important to stay abreast of those indicators of patient performance. Um, Another um, test of how the organization is performing relative to its peer group, and this gets really to the value consideration, uh, is an assessment of, of quality scores. In this case, uh, quality is measured by patient satisfaction, core clinical processes, and outcomes. Those are all merged into one score, uh, total performance score pro developed by CMS. That's the vertical axis. So the higher up you are on the chart, the higher quality you are on those metrics. Um, the cost equation is the horizontal axis, and the further to the right you are, the lower cost you are uh, on that metric. So in essence, you want to be in that upper right-hand quadrant uh, relative to, in this case, the average, and then we were looking at hospitals across two states uh, for this particular analysis. Um, that means you're above average on quality and you're below average on cost, i.e. a high value uh, provider of care. Um, and the size of the bubbles here is driven by um, the size of the organization um, uh, in this case. Um, so uh, it's net patient revenue um, um, is the indicator there. And then you don't see a real clear relationship by size of organization relative to quality. Um, um, along that chart. Market share trends, again, important to look at at least a five-year trend um, to understand what's going on. In this case, and by the way, all of these were taken from the same client organization masked for this purpose. You can see they have experienced a significant um, erosion of market share over five years. Uh, and one of their competitors has, has emerged from being well back in the pack to being the number two provider within their primary market. That's a fairly significant shift in market share over five years and, and certainly is concern um, for strategic um, reasons and, and how competitive they are going forward. Speaking on behalf of our client, our client was the market leader in this case. You can see them being just shy of 30% market share. What we have done um, in the past is, is look at a number of metrics and and equate um, them to a stable, stressed, distressed um, continuum here. We applied this framework to this client um, based upon these metrics, and you can see where they find. They're, they're at the threshold of stable to stressed. Uh, there's a number of indicators that, that suggest um, being wary or, or at least vigilant in their case. You can see um, they haven't had consistent positive margin, but have had good top line revenue growth and um, adequate reinvestment in their asset base, although a little short of that sustained threshold. Um, but because of that, um, some of those changes and the overall demographic profile, we, we can't assume that they're gonna be able to sustain that top, top line revenue growth. One of the things that's driven that is during the period studied, this state expanded Medicaid. They were a late expansion state to Medicaid. That had a significant benefit in terms of their payer mix, uh, uh, bad debt, et cetera. And so that really helped with top line revenue growth. At the same time, they have seen an erosion of market share. So those are the beginnings of some of those stressed indicators you can see here. Um, but again, using this particular framework, which is more limited, uh, you come up with a certain risk profile that suggests your organization is doing quite well with maybe some beginnings of uh, concern around market share and overall profitability and sustainable of top line revenue growth. Um, if we apply our more robust framework that we've developed since the original framework uh, that looks at these four vectors and across these um, various metrics, we come up with a mi more mixed score. And so you can see across the financial risk indicators that we use, 
they actually score quite well. With one debit, they're a fairly small organization, and so being of small scale, that's an increased risk factor. Um, but they score quite well on that. Uh, stable, moderate risk, 0.87 out of a possible 1.0. And our scale here is a 0 to 1.0 scale. If we look at operating risk indicators, the, the score starts becoming a little more mixed. Again, some staffing case mix indicators are negative. Payer mix has been positive in part because of Medicaid expansion, in part because they're actually doing a better job retaining commercial payers. Um, but some of the key volume trends, um, and again, scale are more mixed. So you see here uh, a, a result which is more along a stressed or elevated risk uh, profile. Um, and the same thing's true with the value risk indicators. Again, a mixed bag. Uh, aligned primary care base is robust with, with good patient panels, and their quality scores are all positive. But um, their experience and performance managing risk and the lack of a retail pricing uh, strategy and significant charge variability are, are negative um, for them. Um, market risk indicators, another mixed bag. The overwhelming negative factor here is a, re is a degradation of their market share position. Um, they have some cause for concern along provider alignment and recruitment. They have an aging medical staff and will need to make significant investment to attract and retain uh, providers to their community over the next five years. Uh, and that's no, no easy task for a smaller provider in a more rural market. Um, but the consumer preference research is positive. So overall, when you look at these indicators, um, you can see here a, a description of kind of how we think about this scale of performance. Um, but they, they move from a stable, modest risk indicator on a more financially focused uh, evaluation to one that looks at a stressed, moderate risk when we factor in all the, the uh, four vectors, that three of which include a stressed, elevated risk um, score. Um, so our takeaway here is unlike the prior example where they were at that higher end stable uh, to stressed, in this case we would put them at the lower end of a moderate risk band uh, and they certainly need to be vigilant around making sure they're making the needed investment in their medical staff, making sure that they're protecting their market and meeting the needs of their market to avoid continued erosion of market share. They've been buoyed by that one-time um, benefit from Medicare, Medicaid expansion, and um, the concern is without that benefit, their, their uh, position might be more volatile and at risk than it currently presents. So we've got our, our last polling question here. So which area of risk poses the greatest risk for your organization? So this is looking at, as it applies, to the one you're most familiar with, and it's the same collection of financial, operating, market, and value. So please let us know what you think. And thank you, Benson. While folks are um, responding to this polling question, um, uh, hopefully that example we just walked through is, is helpful to you as you consider the interplay between financial, operating, market, and, and value. Um, none of these are isolated, and I think it is important to note that you know, really negative performance in any one um, vector of risk can spill over into other segments. Um, and so, for instance, if your staffing ratios get get significantly out of line uh, or there's a significant change in payer mix, obviously we can see that um, have results downstream for financial performance. And we can see here the greatest risk is seen as being financial, uh, half of respondents. 30, about 30% 30 of respondents talked about operating risk, 17% uh, have talked about market risk, and value being um, kind of a very distant fourth there. Um, so thank you for, for answering that question. Um, Doug is now going to walk through some of the risk mitigation um, strategies and kind of how we think about risk as an organization and advisor when we're working with clients. Doug, do you want to take us through this? Yes, thank you. So let's, in the, in the few minutes we have left, let's talk a little bit about uh, really monitoring and, and mitigating risk. You know, I think it's interesting uh, from that polling question uh, that many see you know, the, the financial um, uh, issues as, as a big, as, as a significant risk. Um, 
Interesting, given that, as Jeff mentioned earlier, the financial indicators and financial um, uh, results tend to be a, a, a lagging indicator of, of other issues sort of working in the background. Uh, so we'll chat about that in a second. Um, but as it pertains to, uh, you know, time and, and, and assessing your, your risk profile, time is, ne is, is not going to be your friend, especially if your operations are declining because, you know, over the course of time, uh, your strategic options are going, if, if, as your operations decline, your strategic options that are available to you are going to decline as well. Uh, so it's not too soon to do an assessment and to appreciate your, your, your risk profile. Keeping in mind the fact that you know, your risk profile and the market dynamics uh, that are that that are that are weighing against it uh, are very fluid and they're constantly changing. Vincent, I'm not sure if it advanced. There it goes. Oops. Um, so what's the best strategy to, uh, to implement to achieve your, your mission and your vision? Um, and, 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 uh, and this is hopefully a conversation that you all are having with key stakeholders, whether it be board members, uh, authority board, uh, hospital board members, authority board members, members of the county commission, the city council, whoever it might be, uh, you know, and, and key members of, of, of your medical staff, um, ideally, uh, all of you are are discussing the best strategy to achieve your your mission and vision. And end of the day, they're uh, really the the key point that we're trying to make, especially here on in uh, on this slide, is that there is no risk free strategy. Whether you decide <laughs> as a group to to continue to pursue an independent strategy, or perhaps you decide uh, to pursue an alignment strategy. Uh, regardless of your decision, there's risk associated with, with what you decide to pursue, but there's also things that you can do to mitigate those risks. Um, as it pertains to your an independent strategy and, and, um, and, and continuing on operating in, in a current state, um, you know, ideally the key stakeholders, the, 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 the senior management team, uh, the, the board, uh, the, the, the key medical staff members, um, they're all rowing in the same direction, and there's accountability amongst the group, um, and and there's there's opportunity to to communicate and to and to assess uh, you know sort of your strategic direction. Um, Jeff talked about operating cash flows and 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 generating cash flow enough to equal your debt service plus 120 percent of your depreciation expense. Uh, if you have the ability or you've already accomplished. Uh, investment in a robust primary care base. Uh, you have a good aligned medical staff. Uh, the, those will, will help to uh, mitigate the risks associated with an independent strategy. Um, and also, if you're able to invest in, a, in an efficient in a well-distributed ambulatory network, um, because like we mentioned earlier, many, many service offerings are moving out of the acute care setting. If you should decide that you know, an alignment strategy is is more beneficial. Well, ideally, you've already set uh, clear objectives, uh, you've determined alignment criteria, uh, and you've done this as a group again among the among the key stakeholders. Um, and then you very and then you select a strategically aligned partner. Um, there are lots of different affiliation structures and. And you need to make sure you pick what's right, what's what's the best fit for your operating for your strategic objectives. Uh, we have um, Stroudwater's developed an, an affiliation value curve that sort of as, uh, assesses the level of sort of commitment and involvement along the along an affiliation uh, continuum that we can that we certainly can share if if people are interested in having a looking at that. Um, and you want to make sure that you've negotiated contractually enforceable. Uh, uh, terms to, to whatever alignment strategy that you decide to pursue. And again, I'll say it, I'll, I'll, re, I'll reiterate, it's important to involve key stakeholders from the very beginning and to emphasize uh, and to have a good communication strategy if you were to pursue uh, an alignment strategy. Okay, so we've looked at this, we've looked at this, uh, this, this chart on a couple of different occasions, but in order to address risk 
and execute on strategic initiatives, you need to know where the landmines are uh, or, where the, or where the deteriorating conditions are. Um, and if you, you know, from an operating perspective, there are lots of tools that you can use. I guess back to the, the comment that I made about the, the last poll question, um, you know, the financial, your financial results tend to be a, a lagging indicator of, of what's happening uh, from an, in, in your operating settings. And there are tools that are available as they pertain to uh, uh, labor and productivity, as it pertains to business office and revenue cycle, um, tools that can be used to, to do an assessment of, of your current operating state. And from a value perspective, um, there, are, there are tools available to help you appreciate new, new payment models, uh, new care models, um, and also to address sort of uh, you know, the, the, the influence of some of the industry disruptors that are, that are, that are entering into your marketplace, or perhaps are already there uh, and, and, are, and are slowly whittling away at some of your um, some of your volume in, in your in your historical patient base. Um, you know, boards need to appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, these risk factors are going to change and, and they take place over several years and they're in a very dynamic, um, in, a, in a very dynamic uh, um, environment and they need to be uh, on a recurring basis. So let's talk a little bit about some of these tools. So obviously, as you as you assess, as you continue to, as you discuss, uh, as you seek to understand, and as you document your 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 operating risk and and appreciate your your profile, you need to do that at least on an annual basis. Um, you need to be putting together 13 and 23 week uh, so, sorry 13 and and 26 week cash flow projections. Um, you also want to be taking the time to identify growth opportunities for your organization. And these are most probably gonna be outside the four walls of your hospital. We talked earlier about the fact that many, um, uh, many services, service lines are moving out of the acute care setting and into ambulatory, in, ambulatory care settings. Um, and many organizations, many healthcare organizations are looking at partnering opportunities in order to uh, take advantage of, of growth opportunities in, in their markets. Um, back to the, the operational improvement uh, toolbox and, the, th and the, 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 the tools that, are, that we discussed in the previous slide, uh, whether it's, um, whether it's dem a demand-based staffing initiative to, to assess labor and productivity, uh, maybe it's looking at your, your, your physician practice <coughs> operations, um, and use of these tools uh, in your operations assessment is going to help you uh, flush out and, and highlight risk within your organization. Um, one other that I'll that I'll that I think we should highlight because there usually are opportunities there is the last bullet under number on number three on the operational uh, improvement toolbox: uh, practice and clinic designations. Um, take a good look at and a close look at the designations that your that your clinics have that are in the community. Are they rural health clinics? Um, are they standalone? Are they are they hospital based? Uh, are they part of a are they part of an FQHC? There are reimbursement implications and operating implications associated with the designations that these that these clinics have. Uh, from a marketing uh, toolbox perspective, um, again, as we move more and more towards consumer driven healthcare, you need to be aware of your retail pricing strategies and aware of. Uh, the fact that people have high deductible plans and they're shopping for their care. Um, and you also need to be uh, deliberately and, and very strategically uh, expanding your ambulatory network of care. Um, you need to be able to, to expand outside of the four walls of your, of your facility and expand the, the, the footprint of your service offerings. One of the areas that we find uh, oftentimes that presents a fair amount of risk and also opportunity is in the contracting area. Uh, you know, have you at least on an annual basis reviewed your, your payer contracts? Um, there are opportunities to uh, provide um, uh, care through self-insured products with some of your local, uh, larger local employer base. Um, and there is also the Medicare Advantage strategies that, that you can take care of. I'm sorry, that you can uh, take advantage of. So I guess 
As far as vetting strategic options, we talked a, a, a quite a bit a, a few slides back about the fact that none of these, none of the um, the strategies that are before us come risk free. Uh, and which strategy that and that pro, which which strategy provides the best opportunity to realize your your organization's vision and mission is going to be different, um, and it's and it's important to vet that and to and again to get to get a consensus amongst the stakeholders as to the direction for, for your facility to go. So this tool, building understanding and trust is, is an area where we have spent a fair amount of time over the last couple of years uh, with some of our healthcare clients that are uh, either uh, government owned uh, or, or well, county or 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 authority-owned uh, organizations. Um, it's important to um, to have a consensus among the governing bodies, uh, whether it's the hospital, whether it's city hall, uh, the county courthouse, uh, the district board. Um, every and each of those organizations needs to understand the constraints and the opportunities that are that are in front of the hospital, and they also need to all understand the strategic risks that are facing the hospital. Uh, and to help them appreciate the opportunities uh, that are in front of them. And the best way to do that is to develop, is to involve all of them and to develop a common fact base. Uh, quanti quantify performance gaps, understand risk factors, uh, and, and develop a strategic initiative and strategic objectives that they're all aligned in. Um, we have found that a good way to do that is to put together a task force that involves uh, a handful of people from each of the each of the governing bodies. Uh, we've had clients where they were owned by uh, 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 collectively by a city and a county, uh, and we've convened a task force that had uh, two or three city commission uh, city council people, uh, two or th uh, a couple of county commissioners, a couple of board members, a couple of um, uh, uh, local uh, influential medical staff members. And you and you assemble them as a task force to build that common fact base, so that they can bring it back to their to their constituencies and help them appreciate um, uh, the the risk factors that are in front of them and the mission and vision that they collectively have have come up with. Because that's a great way to put together to develop a common fact base and develop consensus around the table and within the community is on on operating uh, on uh, on operating opportunities. Um, what goes hand in hand with that is the need to develop a, a very efficient and effective communication strategy because you need to be able to share that, that vision and that mission uh, in the community and help people appreciate what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And keep in mind that very often the messenger is as important as the message that they're delivering. Uh, so there's always going to be a conversation around who's the best person to stand up in front of the group, in front of the community, and to deliver that message. Um, at the end of the day, don't lose sight of the fundamentals. Um, you know, there are opportunities to to develop sound governance and management. Um, there there are, are are opportunities to develop effective strategies, uh, and there are ways and there are effective ways to uh, be able to thrive in in the new healthcare environment that that we're working in. I think probably one of the most important things is to make sure that once you, you can collect as much relevant information and data and analysis as as possible, but end of the day, don't let perfect become the enemy of good. Uh, you know, you live, you're operating in a very dynamic environment, um, but don't wait to uh, find the perfect answer before you act. Uh, again. Ideally, you're assessing your your risk fat your your risk profile on at least on an annual basis. But in between time, you're monitoring it uh, and assessing it and making sure that you're that you're uh, that you're on the right path. Okay, Jeff, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for dialing in and attending. I I know that we do send out slides to attendees. So you can expect those, as well as I think a link to the audio. 
Um, and what we'd like to do is open it up for questions if we could. Do we have some questions? The, uh, well, I want to give people a minute. Use the question box or the chat box if it's on your system. Unfortunately, it's a fairly large group, so we don't have the luxury of going to an open mic situation. But if you do want to type in a question, we'd be happy to answer them. And fortunately, someone is uh, quick on the keys and has already got in. So the question is, once conflicts between hospital leadership and the board have gone public, how can we reset the relationship to be more positive or collaborative? Um, it's a great question, and it, it brings me back to the slide Doug talked about, which were all those those newspaper headlines uh, in communities. And and we we often are brought in um, after a situation has become both um, um, fairly adversarial and public. And I I, I would say um, what's essential is first of all to at least have a handful of folks um, from if it's if it's two boards uh, perhaps it's the county commissioners and a and a, a 501c3 or the district and and the hospital board um, that are in conflict and there's distrust the most important thing is to to um, try to open up a dialogue um, and if there are a, a couple of key people that are, are willing to to try to move forward and, and not um, um, wallow in the baggage in the mud that's essential once you do that um, I would say the next key uh, thing is to try to convene a working group or a task force that has representatives from both entities um, that can agree on a process or an approach to work through the issues um, if you have a working group that's willing to work in good faith and you're able to develop a, a set of, of common facts and objective data it's possible to move beyond the emotion, beyond the acrimony, and beyond history to really address the facts that are in front of you. It's not easy, but we've seen it, um, and Doug, I know uh, we've worked on a several engagements together and then have some that we've worked on separately around the country that have been able to move beyond acrimony and address really challenging issues. Um, but that, that first component is at least having one party on each each entity that's willing to begin a dialogue. The second is once I think you create a work group so those relationships and that dialogue can get uh, more robust and more um, solidified. And then um, I think the third thing is if you can get folks to uh, engage around facts and a common understanding of the situation, really a lot is possible. And then I, I would say the, the fourth point once you've done that is really that com trying to develop that common shared vision um, becomes just the that provides a roadmap and kind of a, a guidepost for everything else. If, if folks can agree on that, then presumably they can they can agree on some steps that will will help move the organization along uh, on that. So I think that slide that Doug presented pro provides a really good uh, roadmap for for addressing that. Doug, is yeah. there anything more you'd like to add? Yeah, I just I would add quickly, like Jeff said, it's imperative that leadership of those constituencies um, sort of steps up and 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 takes the time to sort of appreciate the perspective of the of 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 those other of those other boards and those other accountable parties. Um, and once they've done that, then they can sit down, develop like like Jeff commented, develop that common fact base. Um, you know, Get on the same on the same page as far as mission and vision, uh, and then there's there then you then then you open up a lot more opportunities uh, to actually implement strategies that are effective. Excellent. Well, thank you. And we did have one other question that came in here. It's sort of, what are the early indicators of adverse changes in the strategic risk profile or the the general risk environment, and how would you, what would you look for? You know, obviously if, if financial results have turned down, um, that's obviously very concrete information. I would say that's not actually a really good early indicator. That's obviously things are going on that led to that. Um, I would go back to something that, you know, a lot of organizations that they're facing top line revenue that's stagnant or not growing uh, sufficiently fast, th they then as, as appropriate, enact certain tactics and strategies to address that, to try to meet budget and get back to appropriate margin. Uh, and those are often effective for a while. But if top line revenue is stagnant, um, 
at some point, if that trend continues, it does put the organization in jeopardy. And at some point, to square that equation, uh, leadership, management needs to make changes to the organization that um, can dr 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 dramatically alter its trajectory. And so that's one of those things, if you've had a couple of years of declining revenue growth, so it's still growing, but growing at a slower rate, or it's been flat, um, and management's working to try to achieve budget even within that constraint, good for management for doing that. That's what they should be doing. But I think as an organization, it's important to step back and say, there's some, some bigger factors going on here that we need to address. And, and um, we obviously need to try to change that, that major constraint, which is top line revenue. I would point to that one as the major uh, early indicator, or at least one of them. All right. And yeah. Doug, anything more to add? Uh, you know, just one thing very briefly, I, I would also tell you, pay attention to what's happening, especially in your primary service area, because if there are more and more competitive forces coming in, whether it's with uh, putting in physician practices, uh, you know, ambulatory care sites, they've seen something that that you've missed, or perhaps uh, they maybe it's something that you're aware of, but they're acting before you are, and 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 you need to pay attention to sort of the competitive forces that are coming into your market. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. If you have other questions, by all means, feel free to contact either Jeff or Doug with the information that's on the screen. And so to keep everybody on schedule, we'll say thank you very much and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.